Hey. Today I'm almost speechless. Back I now I've even forgotten to say hello. Hello everyone. So I'm sure some of you have seen uh, a document circulating about a meeting between parents of a certain very wealthy school and the owner of the school. That whatever the owner said was just, it's just abusive. And yet that is just the worst example. I've seen other other letters from schools about e-learning and I'm telling you the schools are just being nasty and rude and talking down at parents. Aki Kenya, why do we accept this abuse in the name of our children? What do you think our children think of us when we are accepting to be humiliated like this in the name of their education? Why are we accepting this? It's because we don't think that education is care. We think it's a service. We think it's service like going to, to buy chips, that that's the same thing that, that uh, teaching our children is like that. Eh. Anyway, ha if you care, stick around for this video. It's not going to be short. So let's look at the content of these, uh, these meeting notes. Um, this is what the owner told the parents. He said that he did not uh, need to consider the plight of the parents whose incomes have been hit by the pandemic because the parents brought their children to school not for an education, but for a brand. And then he also said that he's in a business and he made an investment of a lot of money and he needs his investment back. Um, and so he would even rather close the school than make losses. And basically he told the parents, if you can't pay for the services, then leave because you will destroy my brand. Now I want us to talk about that word brand because this is a word I have been complaining about for quite a while now. So what does this word brand mean? I'm sure you've heard it from the business people when they're talking about uh, strengthening the brand, meaning they want their products to be noticeable and respected just by the name. Um, but let's go back to the original meaning of the word brand. Brand from the old English starts uh, as a word referring to fire. And later on, as we know, brand means when is used for, for cattle. Um, and you can see from this picture. What happens with branding is that you put a piece of metal in the fire, and then when it's hot, you make a mark on your cow. And that is the mark you will use to distinguish your cow from other cows. Now, this process has been transferred to human beings of making a mark on us so that we can be owned by someone else, so that our, our work and our ideas can be owned by someone else. Um, just before the Industrial Revolution began, um, people were now starting to move to the cities and there was no work. But the owners of the industries were getting worried that so many people in the cities without work would would be would would be a problem a social problem so what did they do they made laws to force people to work but remember this is england everybody is white so you can't tell who is not working and who is working so what did they do they put brands on people's foreheads to make sure that they work so if you are found without work and you have that brand, you are executed for not having work, for not making people rich. That's what branding is. Now, uh, of course, this kind of branding ended when they found that 
actually we can make Africans work because their skin is already branded with color. So we can all, always force them to work. Whenever we see an African, we can force them to work. And you, if you check the, the movie which uh, Lupita Nyong'o won the Oscar for, the movie is about a man who was a free man, but he was made to become a, a slave because he was black. That's what branding is. And you also see that during the Holocaust, uh, the people who, the, the Jews were branded with numbers. So branding is a very inhuman process when it is done to human beings. And it is a way of saying, I own this human being. Their labor, whoever they are, belongs to me. Now, in this era, this branding has, has been transferred to products. So um, I encourage you to watch the, the film No Logo by Naomi Klein, where she explains what is happening with branding in the marketplace. The big name, names in, in manufacturing these days are not making products themselves. What they are doing is selling their brand to other companies. So when you buy a certain brand of a shoe, for instance, in the US, it has not been made in the US. It has been made somewhere else by another factory and that factory buy, pays for the brand. So all these uh, big names and rich people you hear they're being called the manufacturer of this and the manufacturer of the other, they stopped manufacturing a long time ago. What they do is that they rent their name. They rent their name to somebody else. So when this uh, school owner is saying, that you're paying for the brand. He's right, you're paying for the name. You're not paying for whatever service you're going to get in the school, you're paying for the name. And that's why when parents come and say, you know, look at the humanity of this situation, we don't have income. The owner rightly says, I'm in business. I have a brand to protect, you came to pay for my brand and my brand is going to suffer if you don't pay for, for the education. Now, what does this mean when schools start becoming brand names? It means that the owners are now expecting you to pay for a product, not for a service. They don't care whether you get an education. What you're paying for is the brand. And if you rich parents who refuse to listen to me when I was talking about public education, if you really think about it, that is what you're paying for. You're paying so that your child can be branded with the stamp of these private schools. And then when you go out there, your child will show a certificate with the brand. It doesn't matter whether they are they are clever, whether they like this job, nothing. What matters is that they got the brand, the stamp of the school. Now, the other thing I kept saying when I was talking about the need for public education is that these people who are investing in education, they are, their point is to make money from the name of the school, not from the education, from the name of the school. Um, so because what matters to them is the product, not, not whether you're getting an ed education or not. Um, and I think about in 2015, there, there were uh, private schools that were being sold in Kenya. I'm talking about Kenya. Private schools that were being sold to, to foreign companies. And you saw this in the news. Um, and, and where are these buyers of the schools coming from? They're not even Kenyans. They are from London others from Lebanon, others from Canada. Surely do you expect those people to care about Kenyan parents when they have no money to pay for fees? Do you think they care about the Kenyan children? And as early as 2015, these guys had already come to Kenya because they discovered that there's a market here for, up, for upscale schools. And they even said that what they were offering is prestige. Um, as you can see here, they are saying um, parents whose children study in these schools say their key selling point is the fact that they prepare students for entry into universities 
from which they later launch their bid for lucrative careers in any part of the world. So that's what they're selling to, to us. They're selling brand and access to opportunities worldwide. And I'm going to share a link of this report, which was now written in 2017 at the time that, uh, we were debating about CBC, about they knew that there was a business opportunity in terms of education. And you can see with this picture, for example, they are pretending it's about uh, Kawaida kids. But when you finally read the report, and I will share the, the link at the bottom of this video, you will see that this is about um, capturing the elite schools. But let's not even go that far to foreigners. The education system in Kenya has always been about branding. If you check my, my video in the interview with the elephant, this is what I said. Even during colonial times, education was a brand. It was a mark on an African that these people are loyal and they will serve the government. So children from areas where people are rebels or people are from the wrong tribe they were not they need they could not get into the school system because the missionaries would not give them a letter branding them as people who can be loyal so the school system in Kenya has always been a branding mission and then even now go to these elite schools these these uh, posh uh, former european or the Top mission, the top missionary schools that are always scoring many points. Why do people uh, scramble to get into those schools? It's because they want to be branded. When you go to these certain schools, which I will not name, but you know them, when you go to these national schools, what happens? You become branded so that when you, you not only pass exams, in fact, passing exams is just half the story. When you leave school and you start working, you start meeting your peers. You meet them as judges, as doctors, as engineers, in all the posh areas. And then when you give them their CV, your CV, they see, oh, so-and-so was in my former school. We are together. And they take care of one another. And this is why parents are fighting tooth and nail to put their children in these schools that that will brand them and even the government is in this racket because why do they have these exams where they even put police to guard them it's because they are defending the brands of the top elite schools and of the private sector schools uh, look at this what happened when there was bullying at alliance high school just check what ntv said and what matiangi said for decades, Alliance High School has stood shoulders above its peers as a paragon of academic excellence, often producing the country's top performing students. But tales of senior students bullying the younger ones with near fatal consequences are threatening the reputation of the school. However, the Cabinet Secretary for Education says there is no need for panic. Work together with all the stakeholders involved, we are happy that the school environment is okay and whatever challenges we have, we will resolve them quietly and work together with all the stakeholders involved to ensure that that learning environment continues to be prestigious, comfortable and nice for our children. But notice what the NTV introduction to this story was. This is what the journalist said. Alliance has stood above its peers as the paragon of academic excellence. So here is not about uh what the school does what education is who the people who have been educated in this school are it's about the brand that alliance is prestigious and its prestige must be guarded and then machangi continues with that same line he says no need for panic we shall resolve the challenges quietly uh to ensure and this he says that the learning environment continues to be prestigious comfortable and nice, prestigious. That was the worry here. The worry was that the school's prestige would be lowered by these stories. And then later on, if you watch the whole clip uh, at the link below, below he says, um, 
He thanks the Old Boys Association. And that's what this is. This is about getting children into the Old Boys and the Old Girls Associations so that after school, they can start collecting with uh, collecting the revenue from these associations so that wherever they go, they are guaranteed uh, hasty progress because they came from the right school and the person who is in charge came from the same school. And, and, and you can see that this brand is, is literally a brand for the children. Look at those scars that they have, those traumatic experiences and torture, that's the brand. They are cows that are getting a prestigious brand and so they must suffer for it. And then part of this racket also is the fact that the government is so lenient on these schools, but the way Machiangi treated Alliance is that the way he treated the Puara schools. When the Puara schools have discipline and, and, taught and bullying problems, what happens? You see DCI sending us Ifikia must today. Uh, hashtags warning them that the, the, the kids from those schools will not get a certificate of good conduct. So there is inequality in the education system, which is reinforced by the government. And, and what this shows is that our education system as a country is about branding. It's about entering uh, the halls of privilege. So you go through whatever torture you need to go through at the school level because at the end you will come out uh, in, 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 as a member of a club. And why does this system persist? Because of inequality. The more unequal our society becomes, the more desperate we are to get branded with these prestigious uh, marks so that we can get a gate pass you know, into, into the economy. And this is why I was saying to understand education, you have to also understand the workplace because uh, prestige is about those who deserve not to work and who deserve to, to scheme and to profit from the work of others. And when we take kids to school, we are taking them to get that prestigious pass so that they need they can be profiting from the work of others and so these venture capitalists knew that when they were coming to kenya to invest and buy out our uh, private schools they were coming because they knew this is a country where the public doesn't know the value of education that all they care about is whether their children are getting the right uh, brands Some of you may be listening to me and thinking, who cares? As long as my kid gets a job and has the right credentials, that's all that matters. But let me tell you why that kind of thinking is very short-sighted. Now, the first problem is that most of you are investing in these schools based on your huge salaries or on your private businesses that are dependent on services. So when a pandemic comes and people don't have money to pay for your services, you have no money. And then you go back to the same school that promised to take care of you with those very nice brochures and you realize that even they don't care. They're not going to stick with you through thick and thin. And it's not only at the school where this club culture uh, is found. Even your children, you think you have gotten them into a good club, but that club, you can't be sure they will be with your child during the tough times. What if your business fails? Are they going to stick with you? Are they going to be as nice as they have been when you're rich and you're able to afford expensive drinks at a club? Now, I know some of us are romanticizing the boys club that we've had reference to on TV. These people are not as loyal as you think. They are only loyal to you as long as you have the money. But when you don't have the money, that's another story. That's the club you are entering your child into with these expensive schools. And now it's not even working even for you because the schools are telling you they don't care. The second reason why this system doesn't work is because 
it reduces teachers to babysitters because teachers are not allowed to be professionals in such schools if the professionalism interferes with the bottom line. So for example, if teachers are told to do some unethical things by the school management, they can't say anything. They just have to do because the school does not care and does not pay teachers to care. The school pays teachers to keep a brand and to make money. And when that, when caring for your child interferes with the brand, the school will tell the teacher, don't spend extra time on that child, even though the child has learning issues, you're not here to care, you're here to make money. So don't, that's what happens when you reduce education to a service. The teacher just stands in front, marks your kid's work, and does not care what that means for your child. That's what expensive private education is about. The third thing is that these schools don't care about, uh, like I've said, about your child's character and so they care about careers. In fact, they teach your child to sell your ch their soul for a career. And basically what you're doing is preparing your child for a life of struggle in adulthood. And you've seen these pictures already. You've seen um, rich kids who are so badly behaved they go drinking during a pandemic and calling the parents uh, to be rescued in an ambulance. They, they, they drink, they, they have no clue what they are there for. They just spend their parents' money with no character at all. Um, and, and that is not even the worst part of it. A lot of parents these days are struggling with children who are disillusioned, um, addicts and suicidal because the children have no sense of life. They don't know what life is for. They don't know what they are there for except to join a club. I encourage you to read the story Purple Drunk by Biko Zulu, which is about such a scenario where this uh, young man doesn't understand why he's going to school. And the mother is so bewildered and keeps telling the son, you will get a good job, your future will be better if you're in school, but the son doesn't see it. And that's what uh, wasting time on branding instead of on education does to a child. It gives them no sense of purpose. And then you raise your child to be disconnected with society. Because 90% of Kenyans do not have this elite education. And so if you give your child an elite education, yes, they might get a job, but they are out of touch with society and eventually the society starts to hate them because they feel that you're out of touch with the rest of us or, and, and you don't know what reality is like. Just check social media. How many times Kenyans are saying that the politicians have no idea of reality? Vitu kwa ground ni different. And you're preparing your child to never know what is their qua ground. And then fourth is that we start having governance problems because these elites are the top of companies. They're in the ministries and they are in government, but they have no clue what they're doing. They're just there for names. As long as you know so and so, you're in. And that's why we have mediocrity in governance because most of these people are, are being appointed for who they know rather than for what they know and what they can do. They can't even work. They're not trained to work. They're trained to, to flaunt their brand names around. And that leads to the mediocrity in society because the people in charge of Kenya have no idea what Kenya is about. They're just waving their names around and their certificates around. Now I want, and, and that is linked to tribalism as well, because isn't that what tribalism is? It's about being branded with the right tribe. It's about who you know. And this is the mediocrity that has infected all the sectors of Kenya. We are governed by people who went to school, who have papers, but they don't know much because all they have is the brand. They tell you they went to this school and the other school, they have this title and this degree, but they can't solve problems. That's what elite education does. 
Now, I encourage you to read an article about the disadvantages of an elite education by somebody who graduated from Yale. His name is William Derisewitz. I hope I pronounced the name right. And he says, and you will find this, the link to his article uh, below this video. He says that um, elite education gives people a false sense of, of self-worth. You start thinking you're more important than you actually are. Elite education makes people inflexible because they stick to the rules that they were taught in school. And again, he talks about mediocrity. It encourages mediocrity because the people who think their name should stand for everything never can never learn. And this is the problem you're seeing, especially in the UK. Just check the politics there. And I'll share another link that UK politics has stagnated because most of the people who are now in law and governance and government came from elite schools. They have no idea what life is really like. So can we break this cycle of bad education, mediocre thinking that comes from this very elitist and exclusive education system? Absolutely, we can break it. Uh, and, and I'm going to suggest a few ways. One is what I will keep saying, we need a public education system. We need an education system that gives everybody access to decent education. Right now, our education serves only 2% of Kenyans. And just check the data. Only 2% of Kenyans pass in KCSE. Only 2% of Kenyans have degrees in Kenya, and most of them live in Nairobi or on the outskirts of Nairobi. This inequality is what makes people more and more desperate to protect the little access to privilege they have. So by removing the privilege, we will, have, we will not be so desperate to be mistreated by private schools and also the government elite schools. This, and, and making education available for everybody also means opening up the economy. We have a very unequal economic system where the people who make money are the ones who are able to grab land, not people who have ideas that can move this country forward or people who do the work of caring for the rest of us. So the economy has to open up. We need to talk about the land question because land inheritance should not be an automatic access to wealth when you have not worked. Now, another thing we need to do, which is linked to the first point about public education, is to change education from a service to care. Care is different from service because care means that the person who is caring uh, is concerned. They will respond to any need you have. If, they have. if there are any problems, they will go out of their routine to help you. That is not what education as a service does. Education as a service only cares that you meet the criteria for whatever and that you pay on time, as the parents of the school have found out. And also, uh, making education about care makes the teachers concerned about your children. And they want to help your children instead of just doing what the headmaster or the school manager says. So for education to be about care, we need to, to free teachers from business interests. Teachers should be able to say, what they think is good for your children, what is good for our syllabus, and not always be taking orders from management or people in government who have no clue what a classroom looks like. The other thing about care is that we have to tell private sector, they should not be talking about our children and what education they are getting. These are kids, kids are not employees. So why should private sector be talking about a five-year-old? They have no business talking about our children. If they have a problem with employees, let them deal with the employees, but not reach out and start telling us how to raise our children. Our children, hands off our children. 
private sector. You have no business talking about our children. And in any case, if the private sector doesn't like the way our children are educated, the solution is simple. Train your employees. It's not our job to subsidize private sector and provide the proper employees because the private sector doesn't share those profits with us. So if you want good workers, train them. Stop telling the societies to subsidize your profits. And then I've, I've already said this, we need to make our education about care and not customer service. But for you to do that, you need to believe that you're a human being and you're worth it. Do you think you can do that? What would you need to do to believe that you deserve better? That's the question I'm going to leave you with. How can you retrain your soul, massage your soul, so that you can start feeling human again and being able to say, this I don't deserve because I am a human being? That's the question you should also go and ask the clergy so that they stop asking for money all the time. They need to tell us. And also the artists, that's what the role of the artists is, is to remind us what it means to be human. And that's why all the bad talk about the arts being useless. We should not accept it anymore because the arts are how we massage our souls and remind ourselves that we are human beings. And also uh, we need dignifying work. Most of us, uh, doing uh, either jobs or businesses that are humiliating, that bring no dignity to us. And that's why the other half of this channel of mine is dedicated to work. It's about us finding our dignity, our creativity, and our love through work. Normally, I finish my videos with the usual, please keep in touch, let's keep the conversation going, and I hope you will still do that. But this time, I want to end with a blessing, because this, what we've talked about, is really heavy on the soul. So I want to bless you, and I also want to bless the children, because that is our job as adults, to bless uh, our children. So this is my blessing. I hope you find the courage to uh, rediscover your humanity. I hope you find the courage to rethink your, the education for our children so that we, are, we have an education that is good, not just for the children we bear, but also for all children. And because of that, I hope you will rediscover and find the courage to politically demand an education system that is good for all children, for all children in Kenya. And because of that, we will be able to have an education system that is worthy of all the children in the world because we are human beings. And as a parting shot, I'll ask you to listen to the song, I Hope You Dance, which was sung by Leanne Womack and Gladys Knight, among others. But let me just finish with uh, some of the words from this song. Don't let some hell-bent heart leave you bitter. When you come close to selling out, reconsider. Give the heavens above more than just a passing glance. And when you get the choice to sit it out or dance, I hope you dance.